for cultivating progress across the South, for working to unconditionally improve the lives of all, and for the bold underwriting of every Gravy podcast, SFA thanks our visionary Louisville, Kentucky friends, Pam and Brooke Smith. DoorDash, Grubhub, Postmates, Uber Eats. If you weren't familiar with these delivery apps before 2020, chances are you've used them since COVID became the shorthand for the era we're living through. Consumer spending on food delivery more than doubled in 2020, but few people in the restaurant industry are reaping the benefits. Basically, all restaurants had to switch to pickup and delivery, and it was really easy to see just how much money they were losing using big delivery companies. That was former chef Aaron Withers. He lives in Lexington, Kentucky. With dine-in temporarily off the table, he took a hard look at the delivery model. I'm Mary Beth Lassiter. And I'm Melissa Hall. We're your hosts for Gravy. 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 A production of the Southern Foodways Alliance, Gravy tells the stories of the changing American South. And this week, Gravy climbs into the car on a cold, wet, late, covid night to deliver dinner. In most cities and a few small towns, delivery drivers have been the unsung heroes of the pandemic. They've helped restaurants stay open, and like many of the unsung in all parts of the food labor story, they've been woefully underpaid for their work. Sarah Holtz conveys the story of a co-op that might just change the game for food delivery drivers. Across the country, delivery apps tend to profit at the expense of restaurant owners and delivery drivers. For one thing, they charge restaurants a lot in fees, up to 30%. To break that down, let's say you place a $50 order. The delivery app would typically take something like $10. It's common for restaurant owners to spend 30% on food costs, 30% on overhead, and 30% on labor, leaving a 10% profit margin. So at the end of the day, after paying for all of those things, plus delivery fees, a restaurant might make about $4 from your $50 order. Then there's the delivery driver, who can make a flat rate of as little as $2, no matter how big your order is. Some apps have started to give drivers 100% of their tips on top of their flat rate, but only recently, and in response to public pressure. In short, Both restaurant owners and delivery drivers get tiny slivers of the pie when they rely on delivery apps. Even before COVID, restaurant owners chafed against this business model. Starting a decade ago, restaurant owners and customers across the country began waging a series of class action lawsuits against the delivery giants. In 2021, the city of Chicago filed lawsuits against DoorDash and Grubhub for charging hidden fees. Meanwhile, Delivery drivers often work full-time hours as contract workers for low wages and few or no benefits. Debates about the employment status of delivery drivers are ongoing nationwide. At the beginning of the pandemic, Aaron Withers saw his industry go into free fall. Doing the math on these apps gave him an idea. I had actually been working on opening a restaurant and um, the pandemic just halted all those plans. So I uh, started pivoting to, you know, what we could do to help the restaurants that had to close their doors. He decided to fight back against what he calls big delivery. He realized the best way forward for delivery workers and restaurant owners was to put them on the same team, to start a true cooperative. He launched Delivery Co-op in the summer of 2020. We don't take any revenue from the restaurants and we pay our drivers I'm a good hourly wage, and they get tips as well, which it comes out to about $20 an hour for drivers. Um, And we also offer health benefits after three months and um, profit sharing options after 12 months. That $20 hourly wage for delivery drivers sounds a lot higher than the typical rates, even after adding a tip. And you're probably wondering how Aaron's co-op manages to pay it. The answer is in the name. Restaurants and customers buy into the cooperative. Restaurant owners pay $300 monthly, and the co-op doesn't take any sales revenue. So restaurants aren't forced to inflate their menu prices. By avoiding those commission fees, a restaurant co-op's membership could theoretically pay for itself on a good Friday night. 
customers become subscribers at $25 per month. When a customer signs up, they gain access to the 10 local restaurants that have joined as members. Persuading diners to pay for the monthly subscription has been one of Aaron's biggest hurdles. But it's this level of buy-in that enables co-op drivers to make a living wage. Several of these drivers are former restaurant workers who found that the co-op model has vastly improved their working lives by providing higher wages and better hours right away. Cliff Myers is one of them, though he wasn't working in a restaurant when he learned about the co-op. When the pandemic first started, I had been working a full-time job on a horse farm. I was doing landscaping and gardening. I'd started to get burned out by the job, you know, six days a week, 48 hours. It was a lot. Cliff is first and foremost a musician. He's played guitar and bass in several bands around town. When he started at the horse farm, it was a day job that enabled him to make time for his music. Uh, Unfortunately, with the lockdowns and everything and music venues closing down and having to operate as to-go bar businesses, you know, I wasn't able to play music. I didn't have I didn't have an outlet to create or to perform or do anything that I'm passionate about and enjoy. One night during the first month of quarantine, after a long day at the horse farm, Cliff was scrolling through social media when he came across a post from an old high school friend, Aaron Withers, who had just launched Delivery Co-op. Cliff had worked several restaurant jobs before, and the co-op sounded like the ideal pandemic pivot. He took the job, which immediately raised his earnings to an average of $20 an hour. That's unprecedented in Kentucky, which follows the federal minimum wage of $7.25 per hour and the tipped minimum wage of just over $2 an hour. Labor disputes in the state turned violent at several points in the 20th century. Most notably, Harlan County endured deadly conflicts between coal miners and mine owners in the 1930s and again in the 1970s. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? As the pandemic stretches on, we're seeing remnants of that class struggle play out between delivery drivers and big delivery apps. According to Aaron, Delivery Co-op aims to put drivers, restaurants, and takeout customers all on the same side. And it's got an important partner in a food justice organization called Food Chain. I met Aaron at a craft brewery called West Sixth, which is adjacent to Food Chain's headquarters. Hey, how's it going? It's going good. How you doing? We walked over to Food Chain, where he introduced me to Leandra Foreman, their operations director. Leandra showed us around the warehouse. When we started, we ran an indoor aquaponics farm, and then eventually in 2017, we built this kitchen that you're in now that's our teaching and processing kitchen. Like so many food-focused nonprofits around the country, Food Chain doubled down on organizing meals for folks struggling with food insecurity in Lexington when the pandemic started. So we were just trying to figure out how to problem solve getting food directly to families in a way that they could actually receive it and it be useful, as well as using our resources best. Food Chain developed a model where they prepare a week's worth of hot meals, frozen meals, and sandwich kits for each household. The biggest hurdle was transportation, and that's where Delivery Co-op came in. It actually started with us doing just a mobile meal handout in neighborhoods. And then as we were looking at the approaching winter months and before the vaccine was out and numbers skyrocketing, and just really thinking about how many families, seniors, and folks with disabilities just really don't have the ability to connect to the food resources that are being provided because of that transportation link. Enter Aaron and Delivery Co-op. Drivers like Cliff deliver meals from food chain during the hours they aren't delivering for restaurants, and they're compensated for a full day's work. Here's Cliff. I like it because I get to do both. You know, not only am I helping out the restaurants, I'm helping out local folks, you know, get get meals delivered to them. There's a lot of pride in that. I was able to find a kind of a purpose in in all this. When we come back, we'll take a look at how the co-op works for restaurants. And we'll meet one restaurateur who considered leaving the industry when Lexington went into lockdown. 
Are you having friends over for a backyard barbecue or gearing up for a tailgate anytime soon? If so, Lodge's new Sportsman's Pro Cast Iron Grill can handle the heat. The enhanced fan favorite has a streamlined design that makes for hassle-free assembly and cleanup. Dual air vents let you control the heat evenly as you cook your steak, burger, or brat. Go to LodgeCastIron.com to purchase the Sportsman's Pro Cast Iron Grill for your next cookout. For their support of the Southern Food Waste Alliance and the Scravy Podcast, we thank Lodge Cast Iron. When I visited Lexington, I rode with Cliff Myers along one of his restaurant routes and back to the main drag, Euclid Avenue, where one of the 10 delivery co-op restaurants is located. Bourbon and Toulouse is a Cajun and Creole homage to South Louisiana plate lunches, serving up large batch jambalaya, red beans and rice, and etouffee. Cliff took off for his next co-op shift, and I met up with the owner of Bourbon and Toulouse, Kevin Hethcote. Kevin is another restaurant veteran who saw several friends close their restaurants permanently in 2020. You know, we've had quite a few people that didn't make it, you know. I mean, we're a giant family, and we've lost some of our family members, and it's really sad. When Bourbon and Toulouse closed its doors in 2020, Kevin even considered leaving the restaurant business himself. No, there are definitely a couple points in there in the pandemic that I was wondering if I should quit the restaurant industry, but it wasn't because of lack of business. It was just, you know, soul searching. <laughs> you know, it can be tough. Business wise, it wasn't that bad, but emotionally, it was really tough. And it took its toll on myself, my employees, my family, and, uh, you know, all my friends in this industry. Once Kevin had resolved to stick it out, he realized delivery apps were a necessary evil to keep his doors, or at least his takeout window, open during the pandemic. So I hate the Grubhub and DoorDash model, but. You know, it's, it's really, it's kind of like they put a gun to your head and you have to do it because you have to get your food out there. And a lot of people lose money doing it. So we have to jack our prices up 25%, which, I mean, we're known as a low-cost restaurant. So it's kind of embarrassing for the prices we have to charge to be able to do DoorDash. And when I found the co-op, I just fell in love with the model. He also signed his restaurant up to support a food chain over the holidays, preparing meals that drivers like Cliff could deliver to Lexington families. Bourbon and Toulouse was one of the uh, restaurants that once a week we had a food drop off and we drop off a couple hundred servings of food every Wednesday and we got paid for it. So it kept my employees busy and it kept food on people's tables. When I was there last fall, Bourbon and Toulouse was open for indoor dining, but facing the same slew of staffing and supply chain shortages as everyone else. Kevin shared his perspective on the watershed moment he says the restaurant industry is experiencing. The pandemic hits and everybody gets laid off and they find out that there's jobs out there where you don't have to work weekends, you don't have to work uh, nights, you don't have to work every major holiday, and you can make the same amount of money, if not more, than sitting on a line as a line cook. Cliff is, of course, one of those people, but his story also stands out. He found a way through the uncertainty of COVID by returning to the restaurant industry. He found a better job in food service at a time when thousands of Americans were forced out of it. I called up Cliff just after Thanksgiving, when he was on a break from fulfilling orders. He told me he was surprised that people had fallen right back into ordering delivery. It's, it's really strange um, because after, after Thanksgiving... Friday and Saturday, Sunday, uh, people were ordering like crazy, like nonstop. You'd think that they'd like still be snacking, eating on uh, leftovers, but they were ready for Italian food and Cajun food and, and the whatnots, you know. Though Aaron Withers is still cautious about expanding delivery co-op too quickly, he has reason to be hopeful. We've already been in operation for over a year. Most new startups don't make it that far, and we're still growing up, so I'm definitely happy about that. Delivery Co-op is still competing with Goliaths like Grubhub and Uber Eats. And in fact, it doesn't require participating restaurants to give up their other delivery app affiliations. But the startup's early success in Lexington speaks to the potential for change in the food delivery business. For Kevin Hethcote, it's all a sign that working conditions need to improve. Now that people are upset that there's not enough restaurant workers because we told them to go get real jobs. Maybe our system is broken and maybe people should be paid a living wage for every job we do. But this industry needs to change. 
Working as a delivery driver for a decent wage is one way forward. Cliff plans to keep driving. It's far too uncommon these days, but he's found hope in a desperate time. I think what we're seeing right now is people are less afraid. They're definitely less afraid to take a chance, to find a, find a new employment, to find new opportunities, to, to you know find something else that's more satisfying, that, uh, that works better for them. Time that they've been able to kind of reflect on their lives and how their day-to-day operations work, they've started to understand, like, there has to be another way. And it's empowered a, a lot of folks to just up and quit their old thing and try something new. And I think it's great. I think it's something to not be afraid of. And Cliff is finally back to playing music in Lexington. Last time I caught up with him, he shared this home recording with me. He wrote it while his band was on COVID hiatus. And it's called Let Sunshine In. Let the sunshine in See it paint up the wall Let the moonlight bright And watch it soak up the hall Might be nothing brand new Gravy was reported and produced by Sarah Holtz, whose work has also appeared in USA Today and Houston Public Media. Just to name a few. We thank Wendell Patrick for Gravy's theme music, Jazar for our diner music. Managing editor for Gravy and all other SFA media is Sarah Camp Milam. Additional editing comes our way by the great work of Olivia Terenzio. Katie King checks our facts. Subscribe to SFA's YouTube channel to watch our films and talks from events. Also, visit us at southernfoodways.org to become a member or make a donation. Your dollars fund our work and help us make more gravy. I'm Mary Beth Lassiter. I'm Melissa Hall. Excited to lap up another episode of Gravy? Tell a friend. Pass the gravy boat. There's plenty to go around.